From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on August 8, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to our Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 53rd episode of Matters Microbial. Thanks so much for listening and or watching, and most of all, for spreading the good microbial word. First, if you do not know the name of Carl Woese, you should. His work revolutionized our views of the relationships between all living things. I'll put a few links to his story in the show notes. For now, please admire the wonderful Lux portrait that Dr. Jennifer Quinn and I created of Dr. Woes. It's certainly true that human beings have a history of contaminating the environment based on their activities. One such form of contamination is with metals of various types. Such contamination can cause health problems in humans and damage whole ecosystems. Here's a headline from last year suggesting the sheer scope of the problem. But how do microbes deal with such environments is a very important question. So I'm beyond delighted to welcome Dr. Jennifer Goff of the Department of Chemistry at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Dr. Goff will tell us about the work she and her colleagues have done studying the interactions that microbes can have to metal contaminated soils. She'll also tell us about her journey into the microbial sciences. Jennifer, welcome to the Quality Quorum today. Thanks, Mark. It's really exciting to be here. I'm also impressed you like read out the whole name of my college, which I think might be one of the longest. I- I'm not sure that it's the longest, but I feel like it's the longest name of any university in the United States. <laughs> it, it just doesn't sound right to say SUNY. I know people do. <laughs> yeah. A lot of times we just like when we refer to self refer to it here, we just call it ESF. So mm-hmm. I'll probably refer to it as that in the podcast as well. Um, so that we can avoid saying SUNY College of, well, State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry (laughs) over and over again. (laughs) And it's interesting. There are a lot of branches of that whole system in the state of New York, obviously. Yes. Um, I can think of about 10 off the top of my head. Yeah, I think we actually have, I I don't want to quote it for sure, but I do think the SUNY system is actually the largest state college system I do believe it's bigger than the Cal State system. I think we have about 80 colleges total, um, and it ranges from community colleges that Mm -hmm. you just grant associate degrees all the way up to full-scale research universities like Stony Brook, Buffalo, uh, Binghamton. And you are at a branch that has a PhD granting program in the Department of Chemistry. Yes. So ESF is kind of... I mean, I not only I think is it unique among SUNYs, but I think it's also really unique just across the United States. So we are one of the more research intensive SUNYs. We're an R2 university, um, but we're really we're pretty small. We have about 2000 students total and all of our research is exclusively within the environmental sciences. So the departments that we have on campus are, you know, we have environmental and resources engineering. We have my department, which used to be called forest chemistry, but I feel like we should have kept that name. It's pretty cool, but now we just call ourselves chemistry. We have environmental and forest biology, landscape architecture, environmental studies, and then chemical engineering, which used to be called paper engineering, and then sustainable resources management, which used to be our forestry department. And so within all those departments, not only do we grant a lot of bachelor's degrees, um, but also master's degrees and PhDs as well. It's really an interesting, when I read about it, it was really an interesting institution. I'll make sure to put a link to it in the show notes. I know a lot of students have interest in environmental issues, and sometimes they fall into what I call the big bio, little bio dichotomy, which I just don't like because it's all biology. Yeah. But this is a really good example of kind of the breadth that you can bring to environmental science. 
Yeah, no, and I think that's like the really cool part of here, especially for me as a researcher within the environmental sciences. A lot of times, you know, you could end up at a place where there's not a lot of people who do the same kind of work as you. And so it can be hard to establish collaborations. But here, it's actually really easy to collaborate with all my colleagues because we're all kind of focused around similar themes. But in a way that's really complementary to each other. So I'm an environmental microbiologist, but for example, I just put in a grant with some of my colleagues here, and this grant was focused around an issue of forest ecosystems and forest soils. And, you know, the team had me on it. I had an atmospheric chemistry modeler. I had an atmospheric chemistry experimentalist. I had a forest ecosystem scientist on it, and I had a hydrogeologist on it as well. So you really just have the opportunity to build these really fun interdisciplinary teams focused around these different um, issues of the environmental sciences and climate change and pollution. So it's a pretty cool place to work at, especially as an environmental microbiologist, because all of our other microbiologists who are here are environmental microbiologists as well. Well, let's go ahead and, and start. Yeah. For people who don't know, do you mind talking a little bit about what you mean by metal contamination and what possible problems there could be that even someone who's a new micronaut, as we call ourselves on this podcast, might be really excited to hear about or worried? Yeah. So metal contamination has been an issue globally, really, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so there's a lot of different industrial processes that generate um, metal contamination as a byproduct. So coal burning, um, and then various like metallurgical processes, mining, all of those things generate metal waste as a byproduct. And so, um, and then even beyond that, you know, there's a lot of metal contamination, for example, associated with agricultural lands because fertilizers, um, a lot of fertilizers derived from rocks and rocks tend to have just naturally very high concentrations of metals in them. So when you take those rocks to make fertilizer, now all of a sudden your fertilizer tends to be enriched in a lot of different heavy metals. And so you can see a lot of agricultural lands that you know, not only do they have issues with like, and then also like agricultural runoff, not only do you have like a lot of nitrogen oxides there, but then you'll also have a lot of heavy metals as well. So really since the dawn of the industrial revolution up until now, people have been dumping heavy metals into the environment. So, uh, you know, a lot of times when we focus on the consequences of the metal pollution, we're really thinking from like a human centric perspective, or we're thinking about more of like your charismatic megafauna, like, you know, what are the consequences of lead poisoning in bald eagles, which is definitely really important. And we should keep studying that. And then also we think about the consequences of metal exposure in us as well. So there's a lot of research in those areas, and I'm not going to dig into that too much. Mm -hmm. But yes, those metals that are out there, if they get to a sufficiently high concentration, can be harmful to us. But what I want to talk about today is how they can actually harm the bacteria that are out in the environment and why we should care about that. So a lot of my recent work has focused on metal stress and bacteria. And so normally when people think about metal stress and bacteria, a lot of times they're thinking about it more from a clinical standpoint. And I know you guys actually had a guest a couple of weeks ago that was talking about using copper for mm -hmm. infection control in hospitals. And so that's where a lot of our research on metal stress and microorganisms has been, is thinking about, you know, copper, zinc, silver as antimicrobials. Um, but I actually like to think about metal stress within an environmental context and how the metals contaminating our environment are impacting the organisms that live in the environment. So, um, you know, the first thing that people might wonder then is like, well, why should we care about the bacteria out in the environment, right? Like they're, you know, I think a lot of people, when they think about bacteria, they only think about like human pathogens and things that hurt us. And so like, if it's not hurting us, do we really need to care about those bacteria at all? And the answer is yes. And it's because those bacteria that are out in our world carry out really important ecosystem services for us. And so in particular, those microorganisms 
are involved in our global biogeochemical cycles. So a lot of people, example, have heard about the carbon cycle where, you know, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is fixed to organic carbon. The organic carbon's broken back down, releasing carbon dioxide, and then, you know, just around and around um, in that cycle. And so, you know, all of your elements in theory have a biogeochemical cycle, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, so on and so forth. And many of the individual chemical reactions in those cycles are carried out by microorganisms. And so what that means is, is that if you have microorganisms that are in an environment that all of a sudden has had some sort of you know, pollutant introduced that's toxic to them, like high concentrations of a heavy metal, you have the potential to disrupt those really important ecosystem functions. Um, and, you know, there's one example that I would really be interested in kind of talking about um, that I think is also has a really great connection to climate change as well. Um, mm. And it relates to the nitrogen cycle. So I have a slide of the nitrogen cycle that I will just have you guys pop up. And so I, this is one of my favorite pictures. I show it all the time when I give talks. Um, and basically what it's showing is the nitrogen cycle. So in the nitrogen cycle, for example, you have nitrate, which gets reduced to nitrite, nitrite to nitric oxide, nitrous oxide, dinitrogen gas, ammonium, ammonium, you know, back into organic matter, and then so on and so forth. And so with the nitrogen cycle, all of those individual steps are typically carried out by microorganisms that, you know, can perform those very complex chemical reactions. And so what I really like about this diagram is it's really emphasizing not only the microorganisms that carry out those reactions, but it's actually emphasizing the enzymes that carry out those different reactions. Um, and in particular, it's emphasizing the enzyme cofactors. And so metals a lot of times are enzyme cofactors. So they're basically just, you know, something that ends up getting bound to the enzyme and helps the enzyme to function. And so a lot of times metals as cofactors work and helping enzymes carry out uh, redox reactions. And so what redox reactions are is they're reactions that basically take an electron from one molecule and they oxidize that molecule and then they transfer it to a mo another molecule. And that's a process called reduction. So in bacteria, a lot of times they'll have these enzymes called oxidoreductases that facilitate the movement of that electron from one molecule to another. And so all these different reactions in these biogeochemical cycles are redox reactions. And so a lot of times these enzymes and their cofactors, and so a lot of times it's the metal cofactor of the enzyme that facilitates that transfer of the electron from one compound to another. And so what I really like about this biogeochemical cycle, this, this picture of the nitrogen cycle that I'm showing you guys, is that it's actually emphasizing the metal cofactor of the enzymes that's critical for that step to happen. And so the step in here that I really want to focus on is the step of reducing nitrous oxide to dinitrogen gas. So nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas. It's a very potent greenhouse gas. It has a much greater warming contribution than say carbon dioxide does. And so there's lots of sources of nitrous oxide. So there's lots of different microbial processes that can generate nitrous oxide, which is undesirable because it's a greenhouse gas. But then there's only one microbial process that can actually consume that nitrous oxide, which is the nitrous oxide reductase. And so the nitrous oxide reductase is a copper containing enzyme. So it uses copper as a cofactor. Um, and that enzyme is very sensitive to different environmental conditions. So if environmental conditions change, a lot of times that enzyme becomes non-functional, for example. Um, and that's not desirable because that is an important sink for nitrous oxide in our environment. So an example that I really like to give is early in my postdoc, I was working on this project where I was studying this um, denitrifying microorganism. 
And so that organism was able to take nitrate and reduce it all the way to dinitrogen gas. But when we grew that organism in the presence of copper and at very high concentrations, or not of copper, at, with nickel, when we grew that organism with very high concentrations of nickel, all of a sudden, what we saw happening in those cultures is they were still reducing the nitrate to nitrite, the nitrite to nitric oxide, the nitric oxide to nitrous oxide, but then it stopped at that step. So the addition of nickel to those copper, to those cultures, inhibited the activity of the nitrous oxide reductase. So now all our cultures, instead of producing dinitrogen gas, were instead pumping out this greenhouse gas, nitrous oxide. And so the reason why that was likely happening is because nickel, which is what we added to those cultures in high concentrations, looks very structurally similar to copper. And so a lot of times the reason why metals can be toxic to us and microorganisms is our cells and their cells have no way of really discriminating mm -hmm. copper from nickel. It kind of looks the same to them. And so a lot of times if you have really high concentrations of nickel, for example, the organisms will like mistakenly pick up that nickel and use it as a cofactor in enzymes that might normally be using copper as a cofactor. And so that's what's likely happening with the nitrous oxide reductase here is when there's high concentrations of nickel present, the nitrous oxide reductase is, you know, having the nickel inserted into it instead of the copper inserted into it. And so the nitrous oxide reductase that's bound to nickel is inactive. And so what that means is, is that during that nickel stress, during that nickel exposure, if you have these denitrifying organisms, all of a sudden, instead of reducing nitrate to the harmless dinitrogen gas, they're reducing the nitrate to nitrous oxide. And that nitrous oxide is just being released into our atmosphere. I really like what you've done here because if you don't mind my summarizing it for, for viewers and listeners, yes. it talks about several different issues that are super important. And the first thing that I want to say is if you're ever interested in the nitrogen cycle and you have an aquarium tank, you know much more about it than you thought you did. Because the night you have to take care of all of that problem because even though 80% of our atmosphere roughly is dinitrogen gas, it is almost wholly inert. And it's and, and, and animals and plants can only use certain forms of, of nitrogen, but they must have it. It's it's a lovely question. Why do you need nitrogen? Why is this relevant to what you're talking about today? In the process of completing that cycle, there's a metal possible contaminant that can short circuit the final step and then leading to the production of all this greenhouse gas. So if there were, for example, a contaminated aquifer with a lot of nickel, I'm not saying that happened, but you could have a situation where now that aquifer is going to produce a whole lot of nitrous oxide. And so therefore you have a lot more of a particular greenhouse be gas being made. So it's a really wonderful example. Thank you. Yeah, so that kind of situation can actually happen in a lot of different environments. So for example, in agricultural systems, a lot of times you will have really high concentrations of nitrogen already present there, and then also high concentrations of metals. So, you know, you're already going to have high nitrous oxide emissions from agricultural systems, and then the metals could potentially just be making that worse. Um, there's a lot of contaminated industrial sites that are like that as well, where, you know, a lot of times like nitric mm -hmm. acid was used as a reactant and just whatever like metallurgical process they were doing or whatever. And so the resulting contamination ends up including a lot of nitrogen oxide and then also a lot of metal as well. And so you end up with sort of this twofold multi-component contamination issue where one component of the contamination is impacting the other component as well. <laughs> No, I think that's a great example. And by the way, it, it's not germane, but I, I, I think you probably know about this. I heard that we can tell when ancient peoples changed forms of metallurgy because we would find certain metals in the ice cores that we wouldn't normally find. Yes. <laughs> and that's when they move from, say, um, bronze to steel. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you can definitely see that obviously in ice cores that, you know, go up to modern times as well. Cause you see again at like the start of the industrial revolution, all of a sudden 
metal contamination went up, 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 and up. And it's just kind of continuing to go up in our environment as well. So yeah. I always say, like, you know, right now, you know, in the world of kind of thinking about like pollution and contaminants, you know, there's always kind of like a contaminant du jour. And so, you know, right now things like PFAS and microplastics are really uh, popular. And I think both are super exciting to study. I'm doing some work with microplastics now. Like I've hopped onto that train. Um, but I always like to say that metals are really the OG forever chemical because you know, we have metals that got dumped out into the environment, you know, centuries ago that are still there today. <laughs> yeah. And and I didn't know, uh, and sorry, this is probably your bread and butter if you don't mind my mixing metaphors, but I didn't know, for example, in the process of refining gold, you produce a fair amount of mercury. I didn't know that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the process of, I mean, gold mine tailings, you're usually going to have multiple different metals in that. Actually, gold mine tailings, I'm just going to like take a very quick detour. So mm. my one of my personal favorite metals, um, or it's a metalloid, uh, tellurium, is what I studied during my PhD. So tellurium is like an extremely rare metalloid. Um, but for whatever reason, I was like, I'm going to study this for my PhD. <laughs> and so you know, you really don't see tellurium contamination in too many places um, just because it's so rare. It's about as rare as platinum. But one of the big places where you will find a lot of tellurium is actually in gold mine tailings because one of the most common um, gold minerals are your gold tellurides. And so, for example, like whenever people are like, tellurium, what's that? I was always like, oh, have you heard of Telluride, Colorado or the Telluride Film Festival? And people would be like, yes. I'm like, yeah. So what that's named after is that's named after those gold tellurides and your gold tellurides include tellurium. So that's crazy. So you you started to talk a little bit. Of, we, we, we've come we've come through a, a lot of interesting issues involving uh metal contamination of one form or another. Mm. And I love the fact that you call it forever, forever metals, the OGs. For, yeah, uh, I call uh, it like the OG forever chemicals, you know, because like yeah. right now PFAS are really big. It's like, this is like a forever chemical. Um, yeah. But, you know, metals really are a forever chemical. Um, and, and I, because, yeah. Oh, go ahead. All I was going to say is I know when you change via respiration using microbes, the redox state of some metals, they become more or less soluble depending on the metal and depending on the microbe. But that doesn't mean that the metal really goes away, does it? Yes, it's still I, there. Yeah. So I'm actually really glad that you brought that up because, you know, people all the time will ask me, like, is it possible to use microorganisms to remediate these metals at this site or at these sites and stuff? And it was a question that I got asked a lot, or I still get asked a lot, because during my postdoc, I worked at um, maybe one of our country's more famous metal contaminated sites, which is the Oak Ridge Reservation, um, which is mm -hmm. one of these sites that the U.S. Department of Energy set up basically during the Manhattan Project era for doing nuclear materials processing. And so nuclear materials processing still continued there af even after World War II was over. And so during that time, a lot of the waste that was generated was just dumped um, out like on the site. I actually have a picture of it, one of the slides, if you guys want to pop it up. Um, so I, I studied this site. And so basically at the site, there were these uh, waste disposal ponds that contained very high concentrations of uranium, but then also very high concentrations of nitric acid and various other metals. Um, and so, you know, for decades before I even started working on this project, people were going into the site and asking questions of like, hey, can we take microorganisms and use them to remediate the uranium here? because the uranium that's at present at the site is in the form of uranium-6, which is soluble and very mobile, but microorganisms in theory can reduce that uranium-6 by just dumping electrons on that uranium. They can reduce it to uranium-4, which is insoluble, and it basically precipitates out and forms like a mineral that just stays in place. And so a lot for a long time, there was this goal of you know, can we use microorganisms to mobilize the uranium here? Of course, that's not going to totally clean up the uranium. The uranium is still present, but it kind of uh, 
keeps the uranium staying in place instead of moving out into the aquifer. Um, and right. so it was one of those ideas that was really, really, really great on paper that like this was going to work and this is going to immobilize the uranium that's here. In practice, there ended up being a lot of issues with it. Um, one of the big issues was is there's an extremely high concentration of nitrate present at the site. And the problem is, is that the microorganisms that would be reducing the uranium, that reaction reaction is a respiratory process. So it's a process that they're basically breathing the uranium. They're breathing the uranium in order to generate energy. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is they can't generate a lot of energy from breathing uranium. It's not a very energetically favorable process. And so the problem is, is at the site, there's also very, very, very high concentrations of, of nitrate, which is another thing that microorganisms can use for respiration. And when microorganisms respire nitrate, so when they're breathing the nitrate, they can generate a lot more energy than if they were just breathing the uranium. And so as a result, if they have their pick between uranium and nitrate, they're going to go for the nitrate. And if there's one, if there's an enormously high concentration of nitrate at the site, you know, they're going to just keep using that and never touch the uranium. And right. so that's one of the biggest challenges at a site like that is like, yes, in theory, microorganisms can reduce the uranium and immobilize it. But a lot of times they won't because they have better things that they could be doing with their time. You know, I'm really glad you brought this up because about a million years ago, uh, when dinosaurs ruled the earth and, and I was in college, when I took an environmental microbiology class, what we did is we precipitated copper out of solution using mm. bacterial respiration. Yeah. And I remember there were articles, even for the public in Scientific American, about using that to kind of precipitate copper from mine tailings and all the rest. But what you've talked about is something that I think is really important. Microbes are not reagents. They have their own agenda, and it's not yours. Yes. And, 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 and that's what you're talking about here. As you say, given a choice between two things, they're going to do what's best for them. I don't mean to imply intent unless you believe energy levels are intent, which I guess yes. they are. Yes. It's really for them. It's really just the chemistry. And, mm -hmm. you know, one chemistry is more favorable than the other chemistry. And so as a result, their finely tuned genetic regulation systems are like, okay, let's turn on the system that allows us to breathe nitrate because it gives us a lot more energy. And so, you know, it's just a matter of energetics has favored one process over the other. I think that's been super because many people either are really, really frightened of, of some of the, remember Hanford nuclear reservation is in my home state here. Yeah. So, so that's another big uh, DOE site as well, where they were <laughs> processing all sorts of stuff and then just dumped it out back. And we're like, we'll figure it out in the future. <laughs> and thank you, past. But but what what but what I'm trying to say with all of that is that you have one hand where people say there's nothing we can do, and then we have other people who say it's it's super easy to deal with by using domesticated microbes. Yeah. And neither thing is is super true. I mean, there's always in the middle, sadly. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean, at these sites, you also have, you know, another issue with remediating uranium at a nitrate contaminated site um, is so if you have a site that has high concentrations of nitrate, a lot of times what's going to end up happening is the microorganisms will reduce the nitrate to the nitrite. And so nitrite's pretty reactive. It doesn't usually stick around too long, but you will accumulate decent concentrations if you just have super high concentrations of nitrate to begin with. So another thing that happens at these sites where you have the uranium and the nitrate together, which is surprisingly a lot of sites, is even if you can get the organisms to reduce the uranium-6 to the uranium-4, there's also organisms reducing the nitrate to the nitrite, and the nitrite can actually reoxidize the uranium-4 back to uranium-6. And so you know, that also starts to speak to the fact that a lot of contaminated sites are contaminated by more than one thing. And so, you know, yes, in the laboratory, if you're just studying one contaminant at a time, you know, everything's very simple and easy. But all of a sudden, if you have a site where there's like 15 different things contaminating it, you have so many different combinations of things that could be going on and that could be interacting with each other. 
So I think maybe it's time to start talking about the reactions that microbes have to these conditions. You started a little bit with that when you started to talk about how certain enzymes are impacted by particular things like nickel. Yeah. So, you know, there's different ways that metals can be toxic to microorganisms. Um, so one way that I had already talked about is a process called mismetallation where so there's some microorganisms have a lot of enzymes that use metals as cofactors and what can happen is if concentrations of other metals that are very structurally similar to those cofactors get too high those other metals can start being accidentally inserted instead mm. into the enzyme leaving that enzyme non-functional um there's other you know another major mechanism that of toxicity that you have with some metals is the generation of oxidative stress um so this is something that happens with copper for example where mm -hmm. inside the cytoplasm um copper will just generate superoxide which is a type of reactive oxygen species um it's really reactive and it basically like you know it just goes running around the inside of the cell oxidizing everything so it'll oxidize and damage your dna um it'll oxidize your proteins it'll oxidize your lipids um, it'll do things like, for example, if you have a protein that has iron as a cofactor, um, you know, it'll oxidize that iron cofactor and that iron cofactor will fall out and that enzyme is no longer functional. Um, so I would say that's another, those are probably like your two really big, um, mechanisms of toxicity, but I do like to say that both of them, you know, it, it all sort of does get back to just metal homeostasis being disrupted mm -hmm. at the end of the day, because, you know, with mismetallation, yes, you have the cells that are just like accidentally inserting the wrong cofactor. But even with oxidative stress, you know, you'll have things like oxidation of other metal cofactors, especially iron um, that's occurring. So I'd say those are kind of like your two big mechanisms of toxicity. And so you know, the downstream implications of that, it's really going to depend on the organism and the concentration of metal they're being exposed to. I mean, sometimes your organisms, if the concentration gets high enough, they'll just be dead. They'll just be straight up dead, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, but maybe at sublethal concentrations, you can start to have other effects where it's like, yes, the organism's alive. But for example, maybe one of uh, maybe an enzyme that uses iron as a cofactor is just non-functional. So I had another project that I did during my postdoc where I was thinking about metal mixture stress um, in this one bacteria. And what we found is during metal mixture stress, the cells were still growing, but they weren't growing as well as in the absence of that mm -hmm. metal mixture. And what we ended up finding out is that the metals were actually inhibiting. So these bacteria were growing. Um, so just kind of back things up. Our, the bacteria under these conditions were growing um, with nitrate as um, the thing that they were respiring. So mm -hmm. they basically were, you know, respiring nitrate to generate energy. And so what we ended up finding in that study is that that metal mixture stress actually disrupted the activity of the nitrate reductase, which was responsible for carrying out that nitrate respiration process. And so as a result, the cells had to switch from nitrate respiration, which generates a lot of energy from them for them to just glucose fermentation, which generates a lot less energy. And so as a result, yes, the cells could still grow, but they weren't growing as well because their process that they were using to generate a lot of energy had been inhibited by the metals. And this is also going to cause all kinds of problems with networks of organisms working together. Yes. So it's going to disrupt population structure of the microbial communities. So just as we're concerned about the effects of, of contamination with metals on us, mm. say eating, eating paint chips and that kind of stuff, that was a big deal when I was a boy yeah. because of lead-based paints. And it was a you real problem. You know, it's problem. still a big deal in our academic buildings as well. <laughs> Uh, let's not get, we're not going to talk about asbestos or arsenic today, but, 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 you know, my point is with all of that is that it affects the microbial communities as well. And, and since I'm a microbial centrist, that's going to be a big deal to me. So you've talked about 
several of your research projects that have been very interesting. And what they've taught me as I'm mm -hmm. hearing them is, is that it's always a network of organisms. And we tend to be so reductionist in how we look at things like one type of stress, one type of organism. And I understand why we do it, but that's not how it works in nature at all. Yes. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of my work now is actually focusing on combinations of stress and how those combinations of stress impact microorganisms. So during my postdoc, as I mentioned, I'd done this whole project where I was studying impacts of metal mixtures on microorganisms. And so I did this whole project where I was comparing the effect of the mixture to the effects of the individual constituents of the mixture. So this mixture had eight different metals in it. And then the individual, because a lot of sites are actually, I mean, there's very few sites that are contaminated by just one metal. Like that's what I always like to point out to people. And when you point out people are always like, oh yeah, that is true. That does make sense. There's, you know, there's never going to be a site that's just contaminated by copper. Like for example, the, you know, you have a, um, an EPA Superfund site nearby you that you were sharing mm -hmm. with me earlier. And it's a former copper smelting site. And so that site um, just from the metals they're tracking, you know, I was seeing that there's high levels of lead, high levels of arsenic. I mean, they were doing copper smelting there. So there's probably high levels of like copper. There's probably high levels of cadmium and zinc as well. Oh. So most environments, when there's metal contamination, there's usually more than one metal. Um, but in the microbiology world, we've typically, when we've studied metal stress in microorganisms, we've just focused on one metal at a time. And we've learned a lot of really great information from that. There's this whole just amazing, rich body of literature on single mass metal stress in microorganisms that's really informed my work. Um, but what I ended up studying during my postdoc was I was kind of comparing the effects of the mixture to the individual components of the mixture. And what I found is that during the metal mixture stress, you know, the cellular response to that was just so unique and different from what we saw with the individual metal stressors that I suddenly was like, oh my God, if we really want to understand, you know, how microorganisms respond to metal stress in their environment, if we keep just doing single metal exposures, we're not really seeing what's happening. You know, we can't just add up, you know, what we learned from the single metal exposures to predict what happens in the metal mixture or exposure, because a lot of times there's synergisms and antagonisms right. between the individual metals. And so we really need to study them in combination. And so I'm really trying to start to think about like, how do we study them in combination in like a very rigorous and systematic way? Because I mean, there's so many combinations you could possibly study and the more metals you drop in, the more complex it is to sort of disentangle things. So I was doing an eight metal mixture for my postdoc. We're kind of in my lab right now. We're switching to just doing binary combinations and then thinking mm -hmm. about how to scale up from there. So uh, what kinds of, so we we mentioned about some negative effects on say the way particular enzymes work or overall oxidative mm -hmm. damage throughout the different biological molecules within a cell. Mm -hmm. Do bacteria have ways of fighting back? I, that's a wrong term. Yes. I don't mean to make everything martial, but there you go. Yeah, 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 definitely. So that starts to get into, okay, so you'll typically hear them referred to as metal resistance genes. You'll see them referred to in the literature as heavy metal resistance genes, which is fine, but I actually am a big proponent of starting to call them heavy metal homeostasis genes. Um because for a lot of times, for a lot of metals, it's not necessarily a matter of like, oh, I'm just trying to totally get them outside my cell. You know, it's a matter of I'm trying to get my intracellular concentration of that metal in just the right spot. So, for example, sure. with copper, we'll, we'll go back to your copper smelting site. So with copper, as we'd actually talked about earlier, there's a lot of enzymes that use copper as a cofactor. And so bacteria need copper, like just like we need copper. It's an essential nutrient. And so the cells need a certain concentration of copper in their cytoplasm. And so they do have these metal homeostasis systems that allow them to bring the copper inside of the cell. So there's a lot of copper transporters, copper chaperones, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, 
But the problem is, is that when you stick an organism into an environment where, say, there's a very unnaturally high concentration of copper, all of a sudden they're starting to bring too much copper inside the cells. And so that's where the other parts of metal homeostasis systems kick in. So the other half of that is like, okay, we have too much copper inside our cells. How do we get rid of it and get things back down to the lower concentration that we need? So a lot of times you will have these efflux pumps that take the metals and then pump them back out outside the cells. Um, but, you know, so yes, a lot of times like those efflux pumps will be called heavy metal resistance genes, but I really just like to think of them as part of a larger metal homeostasis system mm -hmm. that's focused on, you know, the cell has a certain kind of set point, like a, mm -hmm. like a thermostat set point for, you know, these different metals within their cytoplasm. And so you have this very uh, finely tuned balance between importing enough and then exporting when you have too much. Reminds me very much of, of, of how some bacteria prefer a low pH or a high pH, but if you look in their cytoplasm, you see things roughly around seven. Yeah, and and it's a similar way in in that there's a certain amount of the metals that are necessary. Too yeah. little, you're going to have to bring in some because it's necessary, and too much, you want to kick it back outdoors. Yeah, and I mean there are some metals that like the organisms do just don't need. Like most organisms, for example, don't need arsenic. Um, there are some organisms that can actually respire arsenic. Um, but that's another story for other people to talk about another time. But for the most part, organisms don't, arsenic is not an essential nutrient for organisms. So they don't have a, maybe a transporter per se that brings arsenic inside the cell. But for example, the oxyanions of arsenic, like arsenate, they can basically sneak inside the cell through like phosphate yeah. transporters. Um, and then yes, there are kind of like arsenic resistance systems that are focused on like getting that arsenic out as quickly as possible. So you have some work involving, and I just, because I like dad jokes, because I'm a dad, <laughs> you know, the old, the, you know, the bacillus serious, we often shorten that to be serious because that's funny to me. I like it. <laughs> You you have some work with B serious that's been done bacillus serious that's been done in a contaminated uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Do you want yeah. to say a few words about that work? Yeah. So, um, and we can just kind of pop back up that slide number four. Um, so for my postdoc, I as I mentioned before, I was studying, I was carrying out work at the Oak Ridge Reservation which is contaminated by high levels of um, uranium, various other metals, nitrate. The pH is really low. Um, so basically, this is a really, really, really nasty site to work at. So in this image that I'm showing here on the left, you see kind of how all that waste was disposed of like in the mid 20th century. So they were basically mm -hmm. just dumping it in these unlined pits. And then that waste did migrate out to the surrounding subsurface. And so eventually the DOE did go and do a little, a, a good, I don't want to say a little bit, they did a good amount of remediation at the site. Um, and they did stop throwing away waste there. And so they remediated the site a little bit and then they capped it with this parking lot. But as I said before, <laughs> metals are really, yeah, I know you can go park on it. <laughs> Um, so metals, I like, I always say metals are the OG forever chemical. So all those metals that were tossed away in 1950 are still there in the yeah. surrounding subsurface. So the project that I was working on was really focused on studying the adaptations of the organisms that were present there at the site mm -hmm. to those different metals. And so, um, very early on in my postdoc, um, one of my coworkers in my lab had started this enrichment culture from the site and myself and one of my undergrads finished it up and we got a whole bunch of different organisms from that enrichment culture. Um, and, you know, we did the 16S sequencing on them to basically see who they were. So 16S sequencing is just kind of like the molecular name tag of bacteria. Yeah. So we were just looking to see what they were. You know, it was a lot of kind of the standard things that you normally pull out of the soil that you generally assume are just maybe fast growers that grew really well mm -hmm. in the lab, but generally are not at high abundance in the actual site. So we got a lot of like bacillus, a lot of enterobacter. And on the surface, it looked kind of boring. <laughs> you know, there was like, you know, I was just like, oh, bacillus serious, that's kind of boring. You know, I could go out 
to my backyard here and dig up soil and get a lot of Bacillus cereus. And usually it's not a dominant population at those sites. Um, but at the same time, some of my collaborators had also sequenced the microbial community of the soils in that contaminated region where our isolate had come from. And so I actually went and I was just like, okay, so I have like the 16S, like the molecular name tag of this Bacillus serious isolate. I'm just going to compare it against this community data to see like, you know, what is the abundance of my particular Bacillus serious at the site. And what we ended up finding was that in the soil across, you know, all the samples that we had, we had like 32 samples total, like this Bacillus serious was the most abundant organism mm. present. So it was thriving there at the site. And so that was pretty surprising because that usually doesn't happen. Like in the microbiology world, you're usually raised to sort of hear like, hey, whatever you can actually culture from the environment, it's usually not important. It's just whatever grows best in your lab. So that had always been my expectation, but to actually land on something that was important and was abundant was pretty shocking and also just very lucky for me. So you know, and this organism, it grew very well and grew very reproducibly in the lab. So I was like, great, I'll just treat this as my model organism for studying, you know, adaptations to the stressors at the site. And so it ended up being a really fun experience that actually also sort of brought me into the world of genomics uh, mm. as well. So very early on, we sequenced the genome of this organism. And when we got the genome back, I mean, it had a huge genome compared to other Bacillus serious strains. And one of the reasons for that was mm. that it had such a large collection of mobile genetic elements within its genome. So... Uh, and that introduced me to the whole world of plasmids and transposable elements. So in this genome, it had eight plasmids total, um, ranging in size from, I, I mean, it, it, the plasmids alone, I think, accounted for something like 20% of the total genetic material. So it had all these different plasmids present. And then also there were a lot of transposable elements as well in the mm -hmm. genome. So basically, in terms of mobile genetic elements, so you have kind of your core chromosome for the organism. So you have their main chromosome, but then microorganisms are able to participate in a process called horizontal gene transfer, where they can exchange little bits of genetic information with each other. And so the vectors of this process are what are known as mobile genetic elements. And so there's different kinds of mobile genetic elements. So one kind are plasmids, which are pieces of normally circular extra chromosomal DNA. A lot of people know about plasmids because they carry antibiotic resistance genes in our environment, but they can also do things like carry metal resistance genes. And so you know, at metal contaminated sites, like if organisms are swapping around these plasmids with metal resistant genes on them, now all of a sudden, you know, maybe they've become more resistant to a particular metal. So this organism that I had worked with was really good at collecting plasmids from its environment. So it had eight plasmids in its genome that it was maintaining with all sorts of different genes on it. Yes, there were some heavy metal resistance genes, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff as well that I still don't know what the majority of it is doing, but I'm sure it's some really important things. Um, and then another kind of mobile genetic element that we saw a lot in the chromosome of this organism were transposable elements, mm -hmm. which a lot of people know as like the jumping genes. So these are like little pieces of DNA that in their simplest form encode this one enzyme transposase that allows them to just hop around to different spots in the organism's genome. And so they will tend to, they'll either jump around within their host genome or they have the potential to do things like hop onto a plasmid and then go with that plasmid to a new genome. So they can also be involved in horizontal gene transfer as well. Um, but I really like transposable elements because I also think of them as this really great source of genetic raw material yep. because when transposable elements start hopping around the genome, you know, they can start doing things like hopping into genes and disrupting them. Um, you know, changing gene expression, causing gene duplications. So what was really interesting with this Bacillus serious strain is it had an extremely high number of transposable elements in its genome, like far exceeding most other bacterial genomes that you would look at. And so in that initial study, we had hypothesized that the reason why it had such an extreme number of transposable elements was that the cells sort of 
let the transposable elements kind of run wild and like hop around within the cell during periods of stress because that generates a lot of mm -hmm. genetic raw material that then natural selection is capable of acting upon. And there have actually been studies, for example, showing that, for example, like during periods of antibiotic stress, that transposable elements start hopping around a lot more. During peroxide stress, transposable elements start hopping around more. So stress in general is probably something that triggers the hopping around of transposable elements to sort of kick up the rate of mutation. Mm -hmm. And you haven't even talked about uh, conjugal transposons. Uh, so, yes. so in other words, there's, there's, I mean, I say something and I hope you'll forgive me, but I think you have a wacky sense of humor like me. Yes. I'll say that horizontal gene transfer enables such transfer of DNA between unrelated organisms. It's like any of us having children with a Caesar salad. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not being, you know, weird or arch about it. It really is like that in terms of phylogenetic differences. So any kind of situation where something that can receive some DNA, like it's even a teeny advantage in terms of fitness for a given environment that yeah. will tend to predominate. And it's interesting. They're nothing if not fluid, nothing if not plastic. This is beautiful yes. work. Yeah. Yeah. So that really, I mean, that whole study, it really opened my eyes up to thinking about horizontal gene transfer, thinking about genomics. You know, my past, my background had really been in microbial physiology mm -hmm. and like geomicrobiology. So I'd never really done any bioinformatics things, but this opened my eyes. And ever since then, I have just been full on super interested in microbial genomics evolution. Um, and it's something that I plan to continue with as well. And actually, one project that I have ongoing right now is with that Bacillus serious strain. You know, we had seen all those transposable elements and I had hypothesized that like, oh, it's the stress that causes the expansion of the transposable elements. But obviously, that's me looking back into the past and making hypotheses about what I see. And so what I actually did was I was like, okay, well, like, let's play out evolution in the lab. And so I did a laboratory evolution experiment with those strains under, you know, comparing them under chronic metal stress to no metals. And, you know, we're in the process of compiling all that data now to see, you know, not only what happened changes in terms of like the physiology of the organisms, but also comparing the genomes from before and after evolution to see like, you know, do we continue to see these transposable elements hopping around and shuffling during the metal stress at a greater rate than without the metal stress. So I'm super excited about that. These are very complex genomes though. So we're kind of like, okay, we have to figure out how to resequence them and how to interpret all of it because these are very large genomes and have a high amount of repetition within them. But I think once we have the final data set, it's going to be really exciting. So, you, you know, it's, it's so interesting because we're often driven in science again, to be reductionist, right? Mm. And we're also, we have all these, and I'm not going, I'm not using prejudice in the term of, um, in, in any kind of sociological term, maybe bias is a better term. Most of us in the educational system, this is a big deal to me, um, we're oxycentric in, in, our, in our learning. Yes. <laughs> right? We're eukaryocentric in our learning. Mm -hmm. And even when we're a microbiologist, we tend to be coli-centric in the way that we look at things. None of these things reflect the real world. I, I have a motto uh, about the microbial world. You know, it's first evolved, last extinct. Yeah. And- and and I'm being silly about it, but it's also true. I mean, we want to be reductionist. We want to look at simple things, but that doesn't really reflect the natural world at all. So I'm so excited to see that you're trying to look in a complex system what's going on. Yes, it's frustrating, but that's where the excitement is to me. Yes, I agree. And I think it's really trying to kind of find the balance of that middle ground of like, you know, how can we bridge the gap between laboratory studies and, you know, being able to be controlled in our experiments and so we can interpret our results and, but how can we still have results that are generalizable to the field? I also am so pleased that you brought in many different types of researchers to show, you were mentioning hydrolog hydrologists involved yes. in some of your work as well as geologists. All of this is super because I really believe that we, we have better perspective when we have different eyes. Mm 
Yeah. I mean, look definitely. at you. Your, your, your training is in physiology. Yeah. And you're doing genomics now. Yeah. I mean, my whole career has just been kind of like, you know, hopping around between different kinds of departments, training with different kinds of people. So, you know, I started out as a biologist. So I did my degree in biology at Georgia Tech. Um, there's a lot of great environmental microbiologists there, which is how I got brought into the world of environmental microbiology. And so then I went into my PhD at Rutgers in microbiology. But the faculty member that I chose for my PI, um, his name's Nathan Yi, And so his training is actually in geochemistry, and he's in their environmental science and geology departments. So his training's in geochemistry, but he does like geomicrobiology and astrobiology work now. So I started working with him and, you know, I, it took me a, a little bit of time to kind of be like, okay, how can I, what can I learn here that's different and new from what I did before? Because when I showed up initially, I was like, I want to start doing like molecular biology and other things. But I was in an environmental science department and there weren't a lot of resources to do molecular biology. And so instead, I was like, OK, let's let's embrace the geomicrobiology thing. Let's embrace the environmental chemistry, the geochemistry. And so I focused a lot of my training on, you know, geochemistry and analytical chemistry um, and you know, like monitoring microbial physiology by like measuring their metabolite production and mm -hmm. consumption. Um, but then also started to, you know, learn how to like measure concentrations of metals and stuff like that in their environment. So I had that training where I had done the microbial physiology, but within a really like geomicrobiology context. And then for my postdoc, I went to the University of Georgia and all of a sudden I was in a biochemistry department um, with a PI who's a protein biochemist by training. And so I did actually, I, I tried my hand a little bit at some protein biochemistry. I did give it a shot. It wasn't my favorite thing ever, but I tried it. You know, I know how to do it. Um, it was a great learning experience. But in that postdoc, I was actually part of this larger consortium that has like yeah, like 15 mm -hmm. PIs in it, 100 people total. And that consortium had all sorts of people in it. So you have like your molecular microbiologists, uh, you had your geochemists, your hydrologists, um, and then a lot of like microbial ecologists, microbial genomics people. And so from working with them, that's how I learned a lot about the genomics and microbial ecology. Um, <laughs> and so I, I don't know, I feel like my research interests have kind of become a mishmash of like, Anything that's related to microbes and metals. And then now, you know, I'm an assistant professor in a chemistry department. So I, I think this is interesting. You know, one of the things we talk about on this podcast is there's many different paths to becoming uh, someone working in the microbial sciences. And people come from all kinds of backgrounds, have all kinds of, of experiences. But what I find is folks often believe there's only one path. It's just not true. It can be kind of a What's the expression? A drunkard's walk, which is, you know, a random walk, <laughs> random path, a drunkard's walk, whatever, yeah. depending on your point of view. It's what I did. But the point I'm getting at is there's lots of different ways to get to the microbial sciences. And it's so exciting. And I'm glad you share that excitement with me. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, I think, you know, I think the reason why a lot of us really like microbiology, and I think a lot of the reasons why people get into environmental microbiology from various different ways is actually, it's something that you had mentioned earlier, which I'm really glad you mentioned is that, you know, in a lot of our schools and our textbooks, when we learn about microorganisms, and we learn about metabolism, it's like, okay, here's like, they're oxidizing glucose, and then glycolysis, no. TCA yeah. cycle, standard electron transport chain, resulting in the reduction of oxygen at the end. And so, you know, I had just been fed that over and over and over again. And so, which is great, you know, you do need to learn that. But then when I was an undergraduate, I, I mean, I didn't really fully know what I wanted to do, but at that point I was pre-pharmacy. And so I was like, I'm going to take a microbiology class because it's one of the pre-pharmacy electives. And so going into the class, I thought I was going to be really interested in like pathogens and treat and like treatment of disease. But the professor who is teaching the class, her name is Samantha Parks, and she is an environmental microbiologist I know her. by training. Yeah. Oh, you know her? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. I she is the one who brought me into microbiology. Um <laughs> so she's it's an environmental 
I know. It's a small world, right? Yeah. I mean, she's in the microbiology education realm and everything. She's great. Mm -hmm. So she's an environmental microbiologist by training. And so she taught this course from a very environmental microbiology, microbial physiology centric sort of way. And so we spent time, you know, we didn't just cover glucose oxidation coupled to reduction of oxygen. Like we went through Mm -hmm. all the different kinds of Mm -hmm. microbial respiration. So, um, you know, like nitrate reduction, sulfate reduction, but then what really captured my interest were the interactions of microorganisms with metals. I was like, wow, this bacteria that can like breathe iron and there's bacteria that can use, you know, iron or manganese as an electron donor. And so that's what really captured my interest. Actually, the first research I really ever did as an undergrad was studying iron respiring bacteria. But that was really what, you know, captured my interest from day one was like micro metal interactions. And I've stuck with it ever since. So, you, you know, you I found really think your that, niche. yes, I found my niche. And, you know, I really hope also that you know, when people are teaching like their introductory classes, like they can appreciate that, like, you know, how you frame the class and what you teach, it can have a big impact on your students' interests and how they engage with the field. And I'm so grateful that I had this teacher who taught microbiology from kind of a different perspective than a lot of times what actually mm-hmm. gets taught because it launched my career to where it is now. You, you know, it, we're, we're, we're kind of running short on time, yeah. but I wanted to leave you with one thought that this is this is what reminded me of. I, 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 I no longer teach introductory biology, but one of the things when I would do it is, you know, students would have these three by five cards in their brain and we would talk a lot about, you know, electron transport, taking mm-hmm. the electron off NADH to make NAD plus and its final destination in eukaryotes that are oxycentric is going to be oxygen, right? Yeah. And so I would tell, because students would just like write that down. And I said, well, you need to feel it. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I want you to hold your breath. And when it hurts, raise your hand. So in this class, they start raising their hands. And I said, too many electrons. And that's really stuck in their heads because it really is a different way of looking at it. And so that's where I think microbiology needs to be far more central to, to the teaching of biology in general for that reason. Yes. And you know what moves the electrons around is metals. <laughs> those it's true. iron cofactors in those cytochromes. <laughs> you know, Jennifer, it's been wonderful chatting with you. I've learned a lot. Apparently, we're going to be talking a little bit about this contaminated um, area along the coastline here, because yes. I, I think it might be fun to have my microbiology students in the fall play with that a little bit. And so yeah. I will lean on. I will lean on you a little bit. Yes, definitely send me an email. I might even ask you to send me some samples as well. I think, I, I feel like there could be some interesting like metagenome sequencing oh, to yeah. be done there. That I, I, I saw like the maps. I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued. So we well, should be you talking go. about it. <laughs> now, Jennifer, it's no surprise to you that I'm a big science fiction lover. And it, it's it's been well known since some of the work of Fred Hoyle uh, that the heavier elements are the product of of essentially supernovas, nucleosynthesis that take place. We're we're the dust of of dead stars, essentially, all of us. And that's especially true for the metals. And and so my my thought is, since it's not distributed equally throughout the galaxy or the universe in general, perhaps other solar systems could have different concentrations of various things that we call heavy metals. How would that, if there was a biosphere there, Perhaps, do you think, would we find organisms using different types of of metals for various functions? Yes, absolutely. Because we see that already on Earth. So, for example, when you look at your strict anaerobes, um, you know, they're relying on enzymes that emerge during a period of time where there was very high concentrations of, for example, iron present to them in the oceans. There was a lot of soluble iron present because there wasn't any oxygen at that point in time to oxidize the iron two to iron three. So all of those enzymes are very heavily dependent on iron. And the modern consequence of that is, is that a lot of those organisms, they can't survive in environments that have a lot of oxygen um, because there's not enough iron. And then the oxygen will also damage their enzymes by oxidizing those iron cofactors. And then we see a lot of organisms that are more aerobic, you know, those enzymes that are involved in aerobic metabolism and that, you know, 
evolved in aerobic organisms in this oxygenated world, instead of depending on iron, a lot of times they'll depend on things like zinc, for example. And so it's more of like a zinc economy rather than an iron economy. So like, absolutely, I think that you would see, you know, different essential metal requirements on different planets, depending on especially like, you know, what the atmosphere of that planet is and how oxidizing it is. Well, and then also related to the distribution of the elements in general. But but even as you say, if you look at heme and chlorophyll, the central metal is different, even though the overall structures are quite similar. Yeah. Iron versus manganese, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You know, one of the reasons I did this podcast was to scratch my own itches as far as yeah. intellectual issues. So thank you for that. Oh, yeah. It's been great. I, it looks like a really cool site. And I'm always excited when other people are excited about microbes and metals. <laughs> sure. Well, I want to wish you and your family the very, very best. Thank and you. thanks so much. For, thanks so much for being on the podcast. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been really great. Thanks. This has been Matters Microbial a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with awesome links as always, can be found at microbe.tv mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Jennifer Goff is in the Department of Chemistry at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry in Syracuse, New York. Many thanks, as always, to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music. I hope that you've all enjoyed being part of our Quality Quorum for today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.